Please consider supporting Black Women United YEG for the protection and advancement of black women and girls in Alberta. You can learn more about them at bwunited.ca. Uh, they are always looking for donations and volunteers. So please, again, support Black Women United YEG for the protection and advancement of black women and girls in Alberta. Again, that website is bwunited.ca. Hi, this is Mark Lee Morrison from the podcast Low Profile. I live in Olympia, Washington with my wife and two daughters, and I support Vish Khanna's creative control on Patreon because I appreciate his journalistic integrity. Vish talks with a lot of artists I care about, and he never asks any boring questions. I love hearing his interviews, and as a Patreon supporter, I get to hear even more of them. If you enjoy creative control too, I implore you to join me as a sustaining contributor. To make your flexible monthly donation to Creative Control, please visit patreon.com slash creative control today. Suvankam Tamavangsa is a talented author and poet who was raised and is currently based in Toronto, Ontario. Born in a refugee camp in Thailand after her parents fled Laos, Tamavangsa is a published poet whose four works are acclaimed and have earned her a Trillium Book Award for Poetry and also a Relit Award. In 2020, McClelland and Stewart published her first work of fiction, a stunning short story collection called How to Pronounce Knife, which went on to win Canada's most prestigious annual fiction award, the 2020 Scotiabank Giller Prize, for which she received 100,000 Canadian dollars. Suvankam and I connected again recently to have a chat about Toronto groceries and our immigrant parents' home cooking. Our mutual friend, Sean Michaels, who also once won the Giller Prize. Her book, How to Pronounce Knife, Public Perceptions of Poetry and Prose, Writing and Regionalism, Boxing and Social Media, Future Plans, and much more. A part of the Entertainment One Network with the support of listeners like you who follow and subscribe to this podcast and spread the word about it and make flexible monthly donations at patreon.com slash creative control and Massey Hall's concert film series live at masseyhall.com where you can stream dozens of 30-minute films for free including performances by past podcast guests like Basha Bulat plus in-kind support from Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton, this is the 592nd episode of Creative Control featuring the multi-award-winning writer Suvankam Tamavangsa with your host, me, Vish Khanna. Hi, Sue. How's it going? It's going well. Hello. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. I'm well. Where in the world are you today? In Toronto. Uh, how are things going in Toronto? Oh, I should say, it's uh, as we're speaking, it's uh, only a couple days into January. Happy New Year, first of all. Let me go with that. Ha- happy New Year, Sue. You too. Happy New Year. Has it been a happy New Year thus far? It's only been two days. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, every day feels the same, though. Well, I guess I should just say yes, yes. It's been a happy New Year. It is. Every day does feel exactly the same. <laughs> Remember when days, like, you'd be like, oh, it totally is Sunday. It feels <laughs> feels like Sunday. And now, like, every day kind of feels like that weird Thursday-Sunday feeling, you know? Like, you're on the cusp. Yeah. Everything feels like it's something's going to happen the next day, and then it kind of doesn't. That's how I feel. <laughs> Do you have that? I- yeah, yeah, I can relate. Yeah. yeah. So you're in Toronto. How are things generally for you in Toronto? Is everything cool? Yeah, um, I saw some snow. Um, I don't, well, you know, we're in lockdown, so I yeah. don't, but I felt like even when we weren't, I just behaved like we were. So I just didn't do anything except read and write. Right. Okay. You're getting, you, are you going and getting groceries? Oh, yes, I've done that, but I've also sometimes had the groceries delivered. Interesting. I did it once, and it was a slight ordeal because... I I heard about the this app called 
Gosery, G O C E R Y, and it's purposely spelled, misspelled, and they only deliver like Asian food. Oh. That's why I, you know, order from them because、oh. this is food that you can't just go to any grocery store for. Is that like a Toronto thing or is it like national? I think it's just for Toronto. Oh. So, what kinds of things, Wait, what kinds of things would you order from Gosery, if I might ask? What kinds of items? I really love guava. And so I order that from them a lot or、uh, sticky rice、um, mm. or special noodles, specific. Handmade noodles, which they have at their store. Okay. So, you are are you steeped in sort of traditional cooking?、Uh, is that something you do? Because I'm lamenting that I didn't pay enough attention to my mother's cooking, particularly since we, I don't know if you know this, but my family moved to Edmonton, Alberta from Ontario. Oh, so、yeah. I'm very far away from my, my parents and the,、uh, the Indian cooking.、Uh, oh, so, so I, have you. Kind of had to invent things on your own or go by memory? Well, my,、uh, my mom did give us some, some recipes, and actually, not, not only not like maybe three weeks ago,、uh, my wife actually was like, you know what? We have too much cauliflower, we have too many potatoes, <laughs> let's make some Indian food. And I bought some naan bread from somewhere, I can't remember where I got it from. And、uh, yeah, so we did. We actually had Indian food, and I gotta say, my wife handled most of the Indian food. And she did a great job. I was like, this is pretty, pretty close. Like, we were using my mom's recipe. So that's how I usually gauge. I don't know about you.、Uh, first of all, for those who don't know, where, where are you actually? Where's your family from, if I may ask? Oh, my mom and dad are from Laos, and they both live in Toronto. Oh, they're, they're there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so you're from, your family history is from Laos. And so my parents are from, from India. And so、uh, I. I just didn't pay enough attention to what was going on in the kitchen. I don't know. I feel bad. Same, same here.、Yeah. Um, you know, I had my mom's cooking and I took it for granted because it was always at home anytime. But then when I moved away, it was, I realized that there are no restaurants that cook like her. <laughs> so I can't just order takeout, you know. And there's no like recipe that she follows. It's just by sight. I see. And、right. like, you know, a dash here. And, and there's no measurement at all. Like、yeah. a spoon here, you know, of this and that. And then it suddenly becomes the thing. So I really kind of had to memorize how she did it and go by like memory. And trial and error, I assume. Yeah. 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 I had the same thing. Not exact measurements, but I, I, I do, when I go to an Indian restaurant, I gauge how great it is by how close it is to my mom's cooking. Oh. And, 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 and a lot, because I will say, and I'm not just being braggadocious here. My, yeah. My, in her community in Ontario,、yeah. my mother is、yeah. regarded as like the, the top level. Cook. Wow. So, and you were able to eat that like every day yeah, in your childhood. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> but, but I don't know about you, but I grew up kind of resenting a bit of the cultural stuff. Like, the, I, I, we, I was born in Canada. Were you born in Canada?、Yeah. Were you born in Canada? No, I was born in Thailand. My parents left Laos and then we lived in a refugee camp in Thailand, and that's where I was born. Wow. Okay. So,、uh, wh- when did you arrive in Canada? How old were you? I was a year old in 1980. Okay. Okay. So, ostensibly,、yeah. ostensibly you know nothing but a, a Canadian. The food. Well, no, I was going to say, <laughs> you, you don't, you, you, you,、uh, I was born here, so I, I, I've been to India only once.、Uh, how, yeah. How often have you been back to Thailand? Never. You've never been? Okay. So, there、no. you go. No. I、yeah. mean, my parents have gone, but I feel like I'm not emotionally ready, you know? That, you know, people think that's where you're from, and you yourself in your mind think that's where you're from. But what if you go there and then the very people who are from there say, Oh, you're not from here. You、oh, can't even see. Well, that's. You can't, right? And then you're just rejected and you belong nowhere. <laughs> right. I had that a little bit. Like I went when I was 12. And,、yeah. uh, you know, when I distinctly remember walking through the streets of, of Delhi and I was wearing, I, I've always <laughs> been into Batman. And I had from the Kmart, I had a very loud、uh, shirt 
that had the Joker from Batman, like a comic book characterization of the Joker and his just giant, white, (laughs) maniacal laughing face. And so I was wearing this sweatshirt and like probably some sort of pants, corduroys or something. (laughs) And every other kid that I encountered around my age was in a kurta pajama. I don't know if they just got back from school or what was going on, but everyone was dressed (laughs) uniformly. So they would gawk at me. You know, I looked like a freak. And oh. and I had a real cultural clash. Like I, we spent like six weeks there, and it was hard for me. And oh. uh, but my what I was were, were you able to talk to other people? Like yeah, yeah, other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were they were also I should say like you know unfortunately our brains have a negative bias. Like now that I'm talking about it, I've obviously I've, I've, I've cherry picked a moment that was kind of weird. But there oh. were there were <laughs> there were lots of kids who were very fascinated. By, oh. by me and by us, yeah. you know, living in a different place because for them, it's like a, it was literally a whole other world, uh, you know. Yeah. And I mean, your circumstance uh, for your parents uh, to leave was obviously very uh, traumatizing. Um, yeah. So my mine is or my parents situation. I don't know if there was trauma of any kind, but I was just having this conversation with someone the other day about how immigration uh, is a cur- is a very curious thing if you don't uh, ask a lot of questions about it, if you don't get to ask a lot of questions about it. Because, like, my parents willingly moved across yeah. the world away from their yeah. parents. Uh, yeah. There's got to be something to that. Like, there must be... Yeah. S- like, they must, they must have needed to leave. Not only leave, yeah. like, I'm not... It's not like I'm moving across the country. I'm moving to a whole other <laughs> part of the world that yeah. I don't know anything about. That's how much I don't want to be here. That's yeah. th- that has got to be significant. Can you imagine doing that now? You haven't even been to Thailand once. No, no. Right, right. I know. Like I think back, you know, like when I turned, when I was in my early twenties, I was thinking about how different, like my life was from my parents because there I was still living at home, whereas my parents like built a raft made of bamboo. <laughs> to get to another country to remarkable. live in a refugee yeah. camp and I'm scared to uh take the bus at night. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, it is it is pretty remarkable. And I mean, I think some of that stuff is uh, swimming around uh in your your latest book, How to Pronounce Knife, mm-hmm. I, uh, which mm-hmm. I, I want to get to. Oh, I, I I didn't say this yet. Congratulations. You oh. won <laughs> you won a big prize, didn't you? Can you believe it? I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, I still can't believe it because also when you win a prize, you understand the value of that prize by the public reaction or the, the room's reaction. You read it on the face of the people around you. But because I won it and I was in my living room. Um, oh, right. <laughs> and, yeah. Right. Like I to me, I it hasn't sunk in that it's true. I mean, I it is true. I mean, it, uh, just it, so you know, it's it's very true. <laughs> you are the winner of the 2020 also, Scotiabank Giller Prize. So also, I I don't want to rest on that idea. Like like somehow there is I should stop now or yeah or 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 that I need to take a break. I just feel like I kind of want to set it aside and and maybe not think about it for a while. Yeah, so uh, the, you and I were going over this over uh, email email a little bit. The first time you and I spoke yeah. formally, and I guess I think that's the first time we met. Uh, yeah, on I, stage. On stage, you were on my long night talk show at uh, Long Winter, and yeah. uh, you, uh, I knew you as a poet. I think I had reached out to Sheila Hetty yeah. uh, about uh, uh, you know uh, having her on the show to talk about a new volume of uh, work that she had edited. Had you contributed to that volume? Do you know the one? Yeah, I mean? the anthology um, Women in Clothes. Yes, um, yes. I had, um, she had asked for a survey and I submitted a survey of her um, in responses to the questions in the survey. And uh, you, they were going to pick um, a few things from the survey to just kind of put together, but she loved everything I said and ended up publishing the whole survey response. Wow. Okay. And at the time, you were more known as uh, a poet, yes? A poet. Known, I don't know about <laughs> that word. <laughs> but you were, but, you um, had... Okay, if you 
it. Um, okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> you had pu- you had published volumes of poetry at that point, I believe. Yes. Yes, yes. I, I have yes. them. You gifted them to me that night, as I recall. So thank you for those. So you were, uh, okay, do you want to say you were an aspiring poet? You were a poet. You just No, because were... aspiring would mean that I don't have books. But at the time, I did have three books of poetry. So I guess we could, it is safe to say that I was, I mean, I am a poet. Yeah. I mean, didn't you win? You had you at that? Yeah, I won the Trillium. I won the Trillium Prize for poetry. Yeah, you you are a prize winner. Uh, Every time (laughs) you publish something, someone comes around and says, guess what? We want to give you an award. So there's something going on with you, Sue. I mean, people like what you do. So anyway, we met uh, on stage and you were very, yeah. as I recall, I don't know, I can't remember who else was on the show. Do you remember who else was on the show? Uh, Sean Michael. Well, yeah, Sean, my, my good. He had just won the Giller. That's right. He had just won the Giller for his <laughs> wonderful book, uh, Us Conductors. And Sean and I uh, were friends. Uh, so uh, I think he, it was a surprise. My friend James had arranged, she, I didn't know Sean was in town. And yeah. he, he was like a, a, a walk. What is it called? He was like a pop in guest. He did a walk on. And I yeah. was I, I don't know if you remember, but I was very emotional. I was like excited yeah. that Sean was there. Yeah. And so anyway, uh, and you two, did you know Sean at that point? No, that was the first time I met him. Oh, OK. There you go. So it was a, yeah. I was. Uh, and have you stayed in touch a little bit? I have. When I was long listed for the Giller, he sent me an email to congratulate me and I told him that it's very hard to stay grounded and to not want the prize to be so close to it and to not want it um I didn't know how to feel about it and to stay grounded and he said well you know uh juries are fickle and um (laughs) (laughs) and you know the universe can be you know, unkind, so steal yourself, but enjoy this moment. He, he um, gave you a, a force field, basically. Just, yeah. You got to actually let it go. As soon as you're nominated, yeah. you got to let it go. Uh, yeah, yeah. Cause it's, to not let your mind go there and think it could be you. I mean, that I found really difficult to do, and I knew that that's where the pain would come in. Well, it's a very, it's a very astute uh, piece of advice, I would think, for anyone who does anything in the public sector, because once you've, I, I assume, like a lot of people, you make things and create things uh, ostensibly for yourself, but of course, and but but, but there's yeah. going to be an external reception to it because of the nature of the work. Someone right. else is going to read it and then maybe opine about it, and like you say, you have to steal yourself for the worst, but then also similarly. Uh, take the, the, the compliments, the awards, the plot, it's all all of that you have to take with a grain of salt as well. Right. Um, right, right. But also, the thing I know about a prize is that prizes don't make books. Writers do. Right. Um, right. The prize comes after, like everything I could possibly do for the book had already been done a year ago. The prize doesn't change a sentence or a scene or a paragraph. It's all done and it has been printed. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I, but it does, when you win, you do get a kind of visibility that even, you know, a good book can't get for itself just because it's good. Yeah. Did you have the experience that even when you were on the long or short list that people were paying more attention to the book? I know that's, I don't mean to get uh, too uh uh, personal mm-hmm. or crass here but i mean that would mm-hmm. normally be gauged by by book sales i assume but uh, and, and and i suppose interview requests and things like that you you sensed something was happening to the book uh, upon being nominated even i'm guessing i sensed something was i mean even before the giller cuz you know i'd only been writing poetry right, so right. i did sense the minute that it be, i wrote like a fiction book there was a different kind of attention and a different kind of machine. Like uh, w- when my book came out, you know, when you write poetry books, you can't expect somebody will send you on tour or um, you can't expect even review space. Mm. But I saw, you know, in print uh, places like the New York Times, 
the New Yorker, the Washington Post, the Globe and Mail, they were giving the book space just on lists or just giving it review space. So I did sense that this is something that's very different from poetry. And then when I got on the long list, bookstores were, especially bookstores, they were excited. They were putting it on the dis. The, the dis in the display window yeah. of their stores yeah. um, and that I hadn't seen before I think uh, for whatever reason uh, there's a certain segment of the book reading populace uh, that really responds to book contests or uh, in Canada we have Canada reads I know when when that occurs people go nuts over those books and those books start flying off the shelves a little yeah. bit. The Giller Prize, similarly, uh, when the long list, short list are announced, and of course when the winner's announced, people will say, okay, well, thank you. Thank you for curating my reading experience. I'm going to get a copy of that book. And I, yeah. I guess that I, it, it, that happens with music and, and movies and stuff, too. It's interesting. Yeah. I think it's just like, well, this must be good. So, Well, I think we're really, as readers, we're not curious. We're afraid to mm. be our own tastemakers, to pick up a book nobody's ever heard of and say, you know what, this is good and I'm going to decide that it's good. Yeah. And I'm going to read it and I'm going to tell my friends about it. We often wait for someone else to come along and say that this is good. Yeah, that's fair. But, you know... Um, is that the investment what, what, of the time? Like, because reading is more than... You, you can't just listen to a song and three minutes <laughs> later have an opinion. Like, to read a book... You got to be all in and, you know, spend however long it takes you to read a book. Is that it? I don't quite understand because I, I was going to ask you about the distinction you were making between poetry and prose. What does that yeah. say about poetry? Uh, what does that say about the state of poetry that it is not regarded uh, as, as, as not even as high a form, but as exciting a form, as resonant a form as prose? Like you've had the experience of releasing award winning poetry, but still not getting press if you will or um, attention but prose does it why is that why do you why do you think that is i think it's how we're educated um often i hear from teachers saying you know my students don't like poetry so i'm excited about this new fiction book of yours Ugh. but <laughs> but it you know it's um but i don't don't the children if i may if i may yeah. so, if i may call everyone the children don't the children like <laughs> songs don't they like rapping yeah don't they like poetry yeah. and other forms what is it about the printed i know that uh it's not my thing but people really like uh like spoken word like slam poetry or whatever people like different kinds of poetry but there's something about the written word it's like it feels like school to them or something to have yeah. to read a poem and I, a contemporary poem and i find that weird because i'm a person when i get a record if there's a lyric sheet i read along I read yeah. the lyric sheet along with the words because I'm very uh, with, with, along with the singing. I mean, because I'm very interested in what the words are. But maybe I'm. Am I an anomaly? Why? Why don't people care? About Probably. You? That's um, that's weird. Well, I think. Well, one thing that you know, this working in poetry and and in prose, what I've seen is that anyone who buys a poetry book feels like a miracle. Right. <laughs> because they've come on their own and they made their own choices. Uh, there was no algorithm or n no influencer who pushed them to come to your poetry book. And they came to it and they chose it and they took it home and they cared about it. Yeah. But, you know, when you write fiction and it's good, then people start calling it poetic. Yeah, so exactly, that exactly. I don't I don't understand either. <laughs> but also, That's a good point. Uh, right. Um, but also, I guess I try not. I mean, even though it is on my mind, I try not to think so much about, you know, why thing why people react the way that they do. Uh, I think people are fickle. And at the end of the day, I can only write something that I love to read. And that's what I want to put out there. Yeah, no, that's fair. I wonder if there's just, I don't want to dwell on this too much longer, but I wonder if there's a perception of poets versus a perception of authors as For well. For sure. Well, like in fiction, there's the idea that like it's more glamorous 
mm. in fiction mm. and also the idea that poets are all they do is do drugs and um, smoke and are are are, are bad you're, you're you're speaking of beat poets from the 1950s <laughs> right. or something i don't think that is that perception still oh, in play is that, um <laughs> I don't. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so. It's like beat poets and Tupac, I think is who you're describing. <laughs> Everyone else is not. I don't think they're doing that stuff. Now, uh, that night we met, uh, as I recall, as I often do, as people who listen to this show know, I, I will often wrap up an interview by saying, you know, what's next? Or what are you working right. on? What are you hoping to accomplish? Do you recall? And I know you recall this because we had the email exchange. <laughs> what did you say to me on stage when I did that? When I said, what's, what do you want to accomplish? What, what's going on? I said, um, well, because Sean was there and everyone seemed so excited about what he was doing. I wanted to do that, too. So I said, uh, the Giller. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Which was kind of audacious, but did, what was the reaction in the room? Did we all laugh? Yeah, you laughed, and because everyone thought that was cute. Well, it was um, a funny, it was a joke. <laughs> it was a good reading of the room joke. Like, you're right, Sean yeah. was there. So it was, I wonder if he wasn't there, if you would have said the same thing. But I think uh, that yeah. was oddly prescient. You, you thought of this moment uh, upon winning, I guess, a little bit? Was it in your head? No, no, you have to, you have, I mean, at the time it was a joke, but yeah, you can't have it in your head no. because okay. it will be heartbreaking and disappointing. Anybody who wrote a fiction book this year, I mean, in 2020 thought that they would win or, you know, qualify to be in the running for the Giller. Yeah. And that's, there are many books published in 2020 and you know they weren't there. I feel uh, I feel particularly badly for you because I know that the kind of uh, social aspect of literary festivals and uh, uh, an award show like this is really important to to authors. I was uh, I'd interviewed Damian Rogers about her latest book recently, and she was relating a, uh, a conversation she had with. Uh, Leanne Batasimasak Simpson. They both released books in 2020. And because mm -hmm. there was no convening of any kind, mm -hmm. you know, at festivals mm -hmm. or whatever, Leanne remarked, uh, Damien said that Leanne remarked, it's like we didn't even release books this year. Like it's like they didn't even come out. Um, well, for me, as you know, that is an experience I know very well because they come from poetry right. so it, for me it wasn't a disappointment this was like oh well i've seen this before and i know what to do with this kind of quiet and this silence right okay now uh, let's get into the, the book is called how to pronounce a uh, knife and it's a, a wonderful collection of short stories i guess i hope this isn't too trite uh, a way to begin mm -hmm. but short stories versus uh, a long form novel. Uh, you're getting into prose from your, uh, p your your time as a poet, I suppose. Uh, what appealed to you about the short story structure uh, for this particular volume? I liked the brutality of the short story. The brutality um, of it? Yes, you <laughs> you get people, you pull people in, and then you let them go. You make people fall in love with the characters, and you end the scene. That is, uh, that's kind of evil sounding. The way you say it, it's like a, <laughs> like a Bond villain almost. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. I guess that's true. Uh, well, why did that appeal? Well, to there's you? an expectation. I, I'm. I, there's an expectation that as a writer, you're supposed to be nice, and <laughs> I, I really like to undo that. <laughs> <laughs> and and I think a lot of readers are kind of shocked and they're also mad. I, I was reading, I shouldn't have done this, but I was reading Goodreads uh, responses to my book and people are so angry because they're like angry that I'm writing about ordinariness. <laughs> oh. How dare I put something ordinary and make it a story? 
nothing happens they say <laughs> nothing happens i didn't I, I i i left each story feeling like something profound occurred I, I never thought of it as nothing although sometimes the most profound things are nothing to paraphrase right. the television sitcom seinfeld i mean on some level <laughs> right nothing is something i right? love that I love starting. Friends. So do I. I do too. I just finished yeah. his uh, Jerry's new book, uh, the volume, the collection of all his comedy bits. So he's been on my mind a little bit. Mm. And but I do think like there, you know, there are, that show wasn't the first. Certainly in prose, there's been a lot of nothing that is something. Uh, so I don't think you are. That's yeah, that's I, a weird yeah. assessment of. That's a weird sort of singular assessment i mean lots of people do this and yeah so okay so the the power dynamic you enjoy as an as an author of of creating these worlds and these characters and then controlling them uh for a little bit and then just say you're you're on your own something about that appeal to you and also i don't give my readers any bearings i don't tell you where you are or like what city uh these stories take place i mean some of them you can tell because i refer to like canadian tire yeah but most of them i just refer to it as with the word here so the book has been published in the u in the u.s and the uk and in the u.s uh in reviews they say it's in america like immigrants and refugees in america Mm. and um, in Canada, they say immigrants and refugees in Canada. Um, but I don't really give readers a specific place. Really. So you accomplished your mission in that sense. If if two countries are saying, well, this takes place here, that's quite yeah. a that's quite an accomplishment for you, I would say. Because yeah. you, you uh, I, mean, well, I mean, do you have any kind of I don't know, some people, some authors, some writers, particularly Canadian writers, we've been raised to uh, right. sort of. You know, to invo- think of place. Well, to invoke regionalism of some sort. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. it. Sort of seems to be your duty bound as a Canadian writer to right. reflect Canada. But to your point, like these are stories uh, primarily about immigration. Primarily about. I mean, so this is where we're coming from. But this is where I'm coming from with this at this point because you, I think earlier you invoked this notion of fiction. But how steeped in reality are these anecdotes to either your own? experience with your own parents or stories from your community uh, is it some is it some amalgam of reality and fiction would you say well i think anytime you create fiction you have to know those experiences or those feelings if a reader feels sadness or loneliness or isolation um, or anger or love, those are feelings that I've known in real life, and I put that into the fiction. Right. Also, I feel like everybody has these stories about parents getting things wrong. But, you know, to tell it, it, you can usually do that within two minutes, and then the story's over. Yeah. But to put it into a book of fiction and make it a short story you need more than the story you have to have style and a sense for voice you make artistic choices you don't just say yeah the 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 simple yeah that's that's fair i can think of experiences i've had with my parents who were immigrants and i guess you would call them mistakes but they were really just i don't know it's I, as I get older, I really relate more to my parents. Uh, as a parent myself, I relate more to them. But then, yeah, I don't know. I was kind of. Were you a bad? Were you a bad Canadian child of immigrants on any level? Were you like? There's a there's a sequence in the in the book where I believe uh, is it is it someone's yeah it's a a daughter says to uh, her mother that you are so embarrassing. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I that's not my name. Like she she's referred to by her uh, formal name, but she is a, the daughter is adopted like a Canadian, you know, Celine. Yeah. yeah, Celine, like a sanitized white Canadian name. <laughs> and I remember my like only like 20 years ago, one of my uncles in Scarborough, uh, his name was his name is Manu. But all of a sudden, out of nowhere, after years <laughs> of being Manu at work. 
he, yeah. his business card started to say Mike. Right. And right. his kids, who are like in their 20s by this point, mockingly, I went over there, we were over there once for a family gathering, and they'd be like, hey, Mike, hey, Mike, we need more beer, Mike. And like, I was like, oh, no, what happened? And, and so yeah. that sanitization story, if you will, uh, I mean, that yeah. aspect of the story I could relate to, but there is this sense of everyone, I think, can relate to what, whether they're children of immigrants or not. They can relate to feeling embarrassed by their parents. But sure. there's, there seems to be a particular sharpness, I think, in my recollection of feeling embarrassed. What was I embarrassed about? It wasn't just that they were my parents. It's that right. they were foreign to the other mm. kids I was hanging out with. Did you have that as a child at all? Well, how powerful in the story to feel that and to have the courage to say it to a parent's face, but also in the story, how powerful for a woman to say, you, you know, do you think I want to be a mother? Yes, the, that's right. The story ends with her saying, no one wants to be a mother, but you can't know that until you are actually one. So there's the daughter trying to to make it about herself and her own shame of her mother and her mother's difference. And then the mother changes it around and says something that is equally hurtful. Yeah, which um, is not something you usually experience Uh that is right. A, yeah. Because usually uh, in stories where children are ashamed of their parents, the parent, you end it there. You don't continue with a scene where a parent can turn it around and remind you that they are, at the end of the day, your parent. And they made a choice, too. I mean, earlier in our conversation, I invoked the notion of trauma as it relates to immigration. and. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that is, I hadn't really, th I, I've just been thinking about that a lot in terms of my own uh, lived experience and, and thinking more about my parents and the fact that they, they immigrated uh, from India to, to, to Canada. But is trauma, look, when I think of the characters, there's a lot of trauma, there's a lot of rage. Uh, even a story is sort of as sweet on some level, it starts out sweet anyway, of a mother who becomes infatuated with Randy Travis after arriving right. in right. west in western in a western country there is some real darkness to that story and and I do think it's a bit of repressed there's something going on emotionally with someone who wants to fit in so badly uh right. in a new place that she gloms on to you know it's not it's a very uh, unrealistic uh, <laughs> sort of relationship she develops with a country singer and yeah. and so i is, is she's also holding on to the gamble right yeah, um yeah when when you move to another country that is so far away in a way you're making a gamble um it's a risk in the same there is no guarantee that you will have a home or that you would do well or that you will fit in, in just in the same way as loving or wanting to be loved by someone famous who doesn't know who you are. Yeah, yeah. There's, um, uh, and so the mother is act, like that feeling of never being loved back or seen even. Um, she's holding or she lives in that spot where it is. she just lives with those feelings and she can't change. Yeah, and it becomes this sort of metaphor for immigration, I would think, to come to a place and not be accepted by the people who are here um, on some level. It's, I don't I don't want to get too English essay on you. Well, this. also, it's um, for me, it's been really interesting to see the reaction. I find that readers who have had safe and good lives see only the trauma in the book. But those people, but there are people who have experienced trauma, and all they see are the little triumphs. So, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, I've seen people's reactions, and they're all very different. And for me, the story of Randy Travis is really about making a man that we've never even heard of ra become Randy Travis for us. 
Um, right. For me, like the the joy of writing is I am going to use the power or the fame that is Randy Travis and I'm going to give it to a man we've never heard of. And we're at the end of the story, we're going to, as an audience, we're going to long and wish for this man to take the stage. And we do, and in the end, that's what we do. Yeah. We forget actually about Randy Travis. Right, because someone else has conformed to the notion of what Randy Travis is and stands for. Uh, right. Yeah, that is a, a fascinating aspect of this I, I actually just want to, I, I know this, these are short stories, so it's difficult to summarize uh, the whole <laughs> action of the book, but just your, can you, in a, in a summarily way, I suppose, how would you characterize the way you've depicted uh, men and women in this book? Because I feel like there's definitely different stuff going on uh, where the men are either hapless uh, or, or they are, you know, there's a lot of pride going on there. Uh, even the, the title, how to pronounce knife is a play on a father who thinks he knows something, I would say. And, and yet the women I think are on a different plane. There's all sorts of, emo- there's an emotional dynamic to the women in each story, uh, that is fascinating to me as well. Uh, there's the fitting in, there's the asserting of oneself, there's the kind of uh, allegiance to maybe their 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 home country. There's a lot going on. Again, it's hard. Sorry, <laughs> hard to summarize. But can you do you see a distinction between the way you've de- depicted men and women in particular? Yes, I think the men are tender and loving, and the women they are not ones who are quiet. You know, whenever we see female characters in the movies or even in literature, they're some side bit or they are the quiet ones. Yeah. The one the ones who buy the bow their heads and do their work. But the women in my stories, yeah. even when they're little girls, if somebody calls them sexy, they'll say, I'll cut it off. I'll <laughs> we'll see what's sexy then. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> or or if someone wants them to have you know some romantic life they'll say what you want me to like just get some guy and pump have him pump me like a hog I mean Mm -hmm. like these are lines that I purposely wrote and I want to see them said out loud by or by women um yeah um, Um, yeah and there's the dynamic between uh I think predatory men or power dynamics where you know men objectifying women or taking advantage of their position and in some cases women kind of maybe going along with it or being oblivious to that aspect of what's going on uh not oblivious i wouldn't say the women are oblivious but it's a transaction they recognize they're the the ones who are in power right like in paris even though the boss thinks He's the one who's in charge. It's really the woman. And even in the school bus driver where she is also with her boss, but she's also the one in power. Well, I feel like the bus driver is, it's interesting. I came away from the bus driver feeling sad for the bus driver (laughs) and 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 not but should you i don't think so i guess not because what is real love is it someone who's just there for a couple of months or someone who's forever yeah and in some ways his devote he knows more about love than that coffee time boss will ever know right right Right. Well, like, I, would that coffee town boss ever tolerate what happened to him? Yeah. Um, it, it's it, I, I. We're getting into some very specific details about <laughs> stories that I really want people to read. Um, okay. So no, no, I I appreciate the <laughs> insights because I. It is a little complicated in a sense to talk about a series of short stories uh, on an hour long podcast because part of me wants to go through each story with you, but I also don't want to ruin. Uh, this wonderful award-winning book for anyone who hasn't encountered it yet. So <laughs> I I do appreciate your insights here. Um, it, just to wrap this 
line of questioning up. Do you see yourself like again? I know that as a as the creator of these worlds, you're drawing from your sense of real life and maybe your your own experiences on some level. Do you see yourself in any of these protagonists in any way? I do. I mean, I do feel like I am all these characters. Like I'm, I have been that school bus driver, uh-huh. you know, I have been it. I write a story about a person who picks worms. Um, mm-hmm. And I know the love of worm picking. I know, I know what it's like to do a job and to be the best at it and to have nobody notice it. Those feelings I know, and I put them into a story. Mm. I know that in, especially in fiction, people care so much about the private life of the author. These stories feel very real, but I think that's the magic of making a story. How do I, how do I make it feel real to someone else? Yeah. And I don't, you know, I don't want to take away from a reader any sense of that magic by telling them the truth of my life or the truth behind the work. Fair, yes. Yeah. Like I've said this before, uh, when we see a beautiful sunrise, just enjoy the light. Why ask, you know, where it comes from, how <laughs> that works? <laughs> I think I think when, uh, in, the, in the realms of sort of fantastical storytelling, I think it's easier to presume that this is a, a conjuring by the creator, whereas a, a volume of short stories where uh, the author might be from, let's say, Laos, and right. uh, many of the protagonists seem to be from Laos, there is a natural compulsion to be like, oh, like, is this, are these stories that maybe emanate from your, if not your your firsthand experience, at least your community on some right. level. That's all. It's, so, I, and I understand that, but it's also, it's kind of dangerous for the author because yeah. what if I wanted to write about some old man who just fixes cars? Then who I am as a person will disappear. You know, like hmm. I, I'm narrowed into writing a particular thing. Um, hmm. Like these stories I wrote, is because I'm a writer, not because of, I mean, they are informed by the life that I have and where I come from. But at the end of the day, they are also really stories. And that's what I did, what I made. Um, And if I want to change my subject matter or my theme, the thing I make will still be good because at the end of the day, I'm just a writer. Has any, uh, let's call them dumb, has any dumb interviewer ever asked you, is this poetry book about you? Did I do that? I I might have, maybe I I did that. I wouldn't call that dumb. I would call it like a a curiosity. Sure. A valid one too. I mean, as a reader, I want to know, you know, it does lend a feeling of authenticity, but also it gives the writer a kind of right to write on these themes. Yeah. Yeah. So and and and, and this group of people cuz what if I wasn't from La- from if my family wasn't from Laos or what if I wasn't a refugee yeah. and I'm writing these stories it would be a cause for pause and question. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. there is a an increasing uh scrutiny of authenticity. Uh, in cultural work because some people have appropriated things for so long that there's a kind of knee-jerk reaction of like, where is this coming from? Like, Absolutely. Yeah. And so I understand. That's why I never, I never feel those questions of, you know, is this about you? Um, I don't feel like it's a stupid question. Okay. It's one, it's one of curiosity and also of wanting to know, to know why you're doing this and yeah. um, if you're the right person to do it. Yeah, I guess it's a, it's more a question of practice and 
sort of methodology even, you know, on some level, mm-hmm. like it's just asking those questions. Uh, on that note, are you, uh, now that you've had a taste of uh, fame and fortune, are you still uh, a, a practicing poet? That is the thing that, you know, brought me to writing. I do, I, I, I am writing poems and I think about it all the time. It hmm. never, even when I'm writing prose, you know, when I, open a scene or close a scene, all the things that I learned from poetry um, come to mind or what I learned to do there, I can draw from all the time. Um, So I'm always thinking with that frame in mind. Okay. You know, a lot of people, uh, when they encounter any creative person and they wonder, we were just talking about like people wonder where something comes from. Uh, yeah. And I, I haven't yet asked you this, but since we're on the topic uh, <laughs> of of maybe your your practice, I, I didn't get a chance to ask you this. Like, how did you begin writing on some level? Like, how did you? That's a real obstacle for for a lot of people. Uh, and you know, how do you start? How how did you? You're th- right. How, how did you think you could even do this? Do you have a recollection yeah. of that moment for you? That spark? Well, you know. Usually when we decide to become something or when we choose a vocation, you know, our parents know people like, you know, they or they themselves do it. Like if we want to be a teacher, you know, you go talk to a teacher and ask them how that happens. For me, my parents, if I wanted to box store furniture or pick worms or work in a chicken processing plant, they knew the exact people to talk to who could make that happen. But mm. to be to be a writer, that was, they didn't know anybody who was a writer and I didn't either, but I knew things like a bookstore and a library. And um, I really, I really didn't know how one becomes a writer. I just knew that I really loved writing. And I grew up in a time where of zines and- Yeah, um, yeah. do it yourself this, kind of stuff, yeah. Yeah, and so I just printed and bound my own books and I just went to bookstores in Toronto and said, uh, will you carry my books? And I sold my books out of my school knapsack uh, that was a normal thing to do. That was before, you know, social media, things like Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, where you could just post a poem and then maybe someone will discover you. Yeah, I, yeah. I, at that time, I just, I just printed and bound my own books and sold them at small press fairs or to anybody I knew, like my dentist. And that's how a publisher discovered me and she published my 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 poetry you sold books to your dentist no one likes their dentist you actually made a point of selling your your wares to the dentist well i knew he made money i mean oh he had money that's a good <laughs> i mean they uh charge a lot right for dental work so what's what's five dollars i see you're like to- I, i'm gonna i'm gonna get a bit of this money back from this guy i get it okay that's that's interesting there's a stereotype about immigrants that i think is steeped in some truth uh in uh, immigrant parents i should say in particular that uh in my experience they really were hoping i did something practical with my right. life practical like, uh, become a doctor yeah or, or, or a, a dentist a dentist yeah. that can afford poetry books <laughs> so my my thing is uh, i always know that the subtext of practical is do something that makes you money because we came here with nothing yeah. And we know what it's like to not have money. So you should do something that makes you money. And I think the other subtext was, and then at the end of our lives, uh, maybe you can support us. Right. <laughs> we don't want to, <laughs> we're on our own here the whole time. Shouldn't you be? Anyway, yeah. did you, did your parents, like, it sounds like you went to them on some level, hoping for some guidance as to whom to talk to, but were they ever like poet, a writer? What, why are you doing this? I, like For was, my parents. The most important thing for them was to get an edu- for me to get an education. I and see. what what I did with it, they just thought I would end up making money anyway, or, or, or just having a job if I got educated. I see. And the minute I entered like kindergarten, I had more education than my parents. Right. So for them to tell me what to do with 
you know, my education. They were just happy that I went to school and they knew that whatever I ended up choosing to do, you know, I, I would be okay. Yeah, there was never any pressure for me to be a doctor or a lawyer and nobody, you know, was obsessed or, or said anything about, well, I think also my parents didn't know that, you know, writers don't make money. So, so they were just like, oh, oh, you know, like they, to that, you know, when you don't, when, when you are a family who's not rich, like when, when you don't have ten dollars it's the same thing as not having a million dollars you just don't you just don't have it Mm -hmm. and um for my family they're just we're we're so proud that i went to university and that i have a degree and whatever you know i chose to do with it they they thought i would be fine but you know i didn't always write books for years i worked in the research department of an investment advice publisher and I prepared taxes. Oh. So, you know, they always, I remember winning awards for preparing taxes and my dad said, and when I told him, he said, oh, isn't that just, you know, what you do? (laughs) Like whatever I chose to do, uh, I would, he, he meant that I would be good at it. Wait a minute. Have you won awards for every single thing you've ever done? Not every single thing I've ever done, but just I'm obviously I, exaggerating. I can do but who, in, I've never, in other fields. I've never <laughs> never spoken to someone who's won both the Giller Prize and an award for preparing taxes. That oh. is a little unusual, I have to say. That is a remarkable yeah. C V. I, I will say also, like, my God, your parents must be astonished. Again, I don't mean to be crass here, but there's a hefty right. cash prize that comes with winning the Giller. They must have been like, What? Oh my, what was their reaction? Well, my dad, he saw, I didn't, so I didn't tell my parents anything about the Giller because they're, you know, they are, there are people in the world that do not know what the Giller is. (laughs) So, and, and, you know, my parents are one of them. So if I told them about the Giller, um, they'll just say, oh, what is that? And you know, that would just kind of break my heart. Um, right. So I, w- I wanted to keep it private. But then, you know, I won. And I didn't even tell them I was in the running. They saw it because my parents watched CP24. The, <laughs> yeah, you know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> For those who don't know, this is like the, it's like a, it's not a static news channel, but it's like a, it's a, it's like a website. It's like a, it's a TV channel. That's basically it's got a news three or four news tickers and the weather and then a talking head in the top left and the traffic. It's it's like everything you would want. Everything, and it's just blasting yeah. information at you constantly. If you go if you go to the dentist or any doctor's office, they play C P twenty four. Pizza and, pizza um, places often will play it. Yeah, just <laughs> yeah. That's right. So that And they, that's where my mom and dad uh, saw me give uh, talk you know in my acceptance speech they saw it aired on cp24 and they saw (laughs) the cash prize and they were and so to them they they i mean they were like my dad said that i had become famous so he just thinks of the giller as something that makes you famous sure sure it does it it does (laughs) that's not wrong And he just says, oh, so people know about people like us. And he says uh, that he was very proud. And my brother uh, noticed that he his friends actually called him and said, your sister is trending on Twitter. (laughs) And, you know, if you know any if we know anything about Twitter, you do not want to be trending on Twitter. (laughs) That's correct. That's normally Uh, true. Yes. But in my case that was like really good news and so that's how he found out about it he's a welder who lives in windsor and um his co-workers were telling him about this prize and then suddenly uh he wanted to he's never bought any of my books but suddenly he put in an order for a whole bunch to give. Oh, huh. and, and i was like 
well, uh, they are. He's reading me. <laughs> That's interesting because, like, in my totally external uh, position reading your stories, I wanted to try to figure out a way to relate those stories to you and your life. So to have your family read them, I'm sure they will have a very unique relationship with these stories because I imagine for them, they'll be like, oh yeah, I yeah. Re- I, I can picture who that might be or I remember some semblance of that episode. Is that fair to say? Yeah, like actually a cousin of mine because I, I was loosely based on my dad and a cousin of mine said, oh, I remember this you know my dad often told stories at parties he was the center of people's attention yeah. and my cousin had said oh isn't that your father um, yeah yeah but i didn't i didn't rem- i mean he just assumed it was and uh but even yeah people in my family think it's about them yeah which which is funny because you know everybody Actually, now everybody thinks it's about them. <laughs> it's, um, well, that's what you when you make something that's open to interpretation, right? Uh, and then you're, but then, and even when it's not about a particular person, that particular person thinks it's about them. Which yeah, is also really funny. Yeah. Well, has anything else uh, sort of not that anything else needs to happen to how to pronounce knife? Uh, it's mm-hmm. it's done very well for itself. But often I, when I speak to authors, they end up telling me, yeah, I put out this book and now it's been optioned for this and it might turn into this other thing. Is there any sense that something might happen to the stories and how to pronounce knife beyond its life as a, as a, as a collection of short stories? There's been discussion about turning the short story collection into a television show right? where all the story but where there's like a large cast of characters but it doesn't star one particular yeah. person yeah. but just like an ensemble cast of some something like like a show that can also inspire several locations yeah. and scenes yeah. oh i had in my i mean the way that they talked about it was something like lost but without you know the um supernatural stuff Right, where it's serialized, but each episode is its own sort of thing. Yeah. Right. And 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 new people, and I really like the idea of how something I wrote in private by myself could create jobs and opportunities for artists in oh. other fields, yeah. like where an actor or a director or. Um, to create a room of writers, that's what I'm excited about. Yeah, that's it's a remarkable thing you've done in that regard, for sure. You did the, the solitary work is now resonating with people, not only readers and, you know, award award juries or whatever, but like it's, yeah, you're right. That's a really interesting take on it. Like you might create a little ecosystem of work and, and creativity. That's great. That's remarkable. You must feel... Or- Awesome. And I think <laughs> when I think one of the lovely things I've seen though are people who don't see themselves as a writer in countries, you know, very far from Canada. Mm-hmm. Um, I've heard I've heard from a young woman in Botswana who read about my Gila Prize win and she felt inspired about being a writer herself you know i i've never been there i the fact that my book or this event or that it won this prize could reach that far into someone and reach someone i've never met and inspire them i'm excited about that something i made could could inspire someone to see themselves as a maker of a thing yeah and so yeah let's that fair. yeah that's that's what I'm really excited about too, or or just I had been asked what makes these stories Canadian, and I said these stories are Canadian because I'm Canadian, yeah. and yeah. I didn't know at the time how mo- how moved people would be by it. Like they think when you talk about being a Canadian that you are 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 
supposed to be white <laughs> right. um, and to have someone who isn't say that well you know these stories are Canadian because I'm Canadian and to say that you're Canadian that I've seen reactions from diplomats living in Tanzania being proud no I mean being excited about the book because of what it represents of the country itself yeah. and so it's not I've seen reactions where people are excited, not just because it's a book, but because it feels like something outside of itself that is meaningful to a lot of other people yeah. who aren't necessarily involved in publishing or writing. It's interesting. It's an interesting way of putting it, because if I didn't know you uh, and know the context of where this book was written, uh, I would not particularly, it would not target my... First of all, I don't have very many uh, uh, patriotic heartstrings, but I I just never really think of things that way myself. Uh, So it's fascinating to hear you say you you somewhat purposely did not set it in any particular era or place, uh, except for a couple of references here and there. I I also I also didn't uh, work in a major theme that is very Canadian like when a Canadian writer writes, they often write about the weather yeah. <laughs> or la- or landscape. And I devote but two lines to such things yeah. in my book. But I did it on purpose because I want to say that you can write like this and still be Canadian. Well, it's been very, it's very effective, if I might say. Uh, it's a wondrous first uh blast of prose and fiction and i see by the uh, book flap here uh, at the Mm -hmm. end of it in your biographical information it says that you are working on your first novel is that true yes yes it's not a lie Uh, that was fact checked before it made it onto the book (laughs) that's all i'm getting at here what is your progress there on the uh, novel at this point well you know uh, well i actually wrote a draft in six weeks i just thought you know, I have the time, I want to get this done. And I want to see what I'm capable of in this short time. Mm -hmm. And I was supposed to deliver the novel in December. But then I won the killer. And so I was distracted. Um, (laughs) Yeah. And so it's been pushed back to April where I deliver the manuscript to the novel. Okay. Uh, Okay. I'm, I'm excited because it's new territory for me as a writer. I see. De- definitely yeah. a departure from the the themes in, in How to Pronounce Knife. Not necessarily because it is about a boxer. Oh, okay. It's similar to Manny Petty. Oh, okay. Interesting. The yeah. Manny Petty story is really fascinating, actually. And yeah. And a very interesting sibling sibling power dynamic as well. Again, I'm trying to be guarded in what I say about everything because I, <laughs> I want people to to read it, but that's a very fascinating story. Okay, boxing fascinates you generally. Yeah, well, to get the boxing right, I spent a year and a half like boxing. Oh, um, wow. And that was very fascinating. I love, you know, like in boxing, you can't wait around for inspiration. <laughs> No, <laughs> when, no. When you get in the ring, everything you've ever known and anything anyone's ever told you just kind of kicks in instinctively and you move and or you get knocked out. Um, I was very right. obsessed with boxing as a child and a teenager because my friend Richard loved boxing. And so we would go and watch every fight. We'd have to go to restaurants, you know, to watch the, the um, pay-per-view fights or whatever they were. And so I just watched every single up to a point, I watched like every major boxing match, and my father spoke admiringly of Muhammad Ali, so I read all about Muhammad Ali. And so boxing is, I, I don't uh, relate to it now, uh, yeah. unfortunately, or not unfortunately, mm-hmm. I don't know, it's pretty brutal <laughs> and terrible. I think the, it more, is. the more you learn about sort of um, CTE and what are we doing, uh, you know, and, yeah. and then there's some, obviously some racist stuff going on there as well, racism, it's, it's very complicated, but... But uh, but Ali was and is a, a hero to me, and and I I'm half ash- I'm ashamed I guess to say how much it's weird how much time I devoted to Mike Tyson as a as a kid uh, given who mm. he ended up being. But 
Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, boxing was that's fascinating. I can't wait. I can't wait to to read that. Uh, and I hope that the uh, the draft goes well for you. That sounds exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to make things harder for myself. Um, <laughs> that's, so, that's a good uh, that's a good impulse. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, and this is something that I've made harder for myself. Like, I'm walking into something I know very little about, and I'm learning from it all the time. Was Manny Petty one of the last stories you wrote for your for your book? One of the last stories was Edge of the World. Okay. No, Manny Petty was like maybe the third short story I wrote. Yeah. Okay, I only ask because I find it fascinating that you vaguely took that story as a leaping off point for a jumping off point for uh, a novel. Um, it just suggests to me that something about it didn't leave you and spoke to you. Yeah. And uh, I know it's early days, but have you already had a sense? Because that's that happens a lot with creative people. They're doing something, and then there's a kernel within what they're doing that launches them into a whole other thing. Uh, like right. they, they might finish that thing they're doing, but there's something that little thing sticks out to them and resonates with them enough that they want to pursue it in a longer form, which is vaguely what you're describing with Manny Petty in this novel. Have you in the, pro- <laughs> in the process of writing the novel you're currently working on, do you see something else um, coming? Do you like, Oh, huh. There's something in there that I, that's not for this story, but I want to maybe explore that somewhere else. Has that already happened? Yeah, like a memoir. (laughs) Okay, there you go. All right. (laughs) Because, you know, so many people are interested in the life behind the the work. And so I want to save those replies or responses for a book of its own. So I haven't, like, talked a lot about my own life. But also, you know, I want to get old. <laughs> yeah, there's a, f- um, yes, right. Yeah, and one thing I want to do um, is, like, travel to Thailand and Laos and to see, because I think if I went there when I was 16 or 10 years old, I mean, I don't, I don't think I, I would have, like, the intelligence or the emotional range to understand what's happening or or to be able to put it into words so um i'm thinking of that in the future it it was this it's always been the source of some friction between my parents and i because in my 20s and 30s they would make these trips to india and they wouldn't even tell me they would plan them and i'd say (laughs) well i'd like to go with like i'm not going to go by myself i don't think i don't think i could handle it Uh, i don't know the language is well enough i do i know them a bit but i just was like well we should all go like can i go my wife uh, you know would want to go yeah. and they were like oh i already booked the tickets and it's too late oh. i'm like oh <laughs> okay and so <laughs> so yeah and now i mean who knows if that's an interesting yeah. uh, thing to uh, aspire to given what we're going through right now but uh yeah anyway this uh the book is is excellent and i really appreciate this conversation sue i do want to ask you you're not really on social media, are you? No, because I don't know. Maybe I'm old and like <laughs> that's not how someone my age like we like to talk to people. <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm old. There's plenty of old people who use oh, it. And I, I mean, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think because no, this is why, because I think. I mean, I understand. Yeah, I've been told by some of my publishers that I need to be more of a presence on those things. But I'm really, I really am old fashioned. Like, Mm. I don't, I want all my energies uh, to go into writing books. Um, And I also, I think a writer should have some mystery to them. Yeah, sure. That, like, if you know what I eat for breakfast, will you want to read my books? Because, <laughs> right, sure. I, I, because you know, are you curious about what I'm doing if I'm telling you all the time? But this does not, uh, this does not preclude you from doing interviews. No, I don't think so. Because I think with an interview, you could, 
I know how to remain private. Right. I think. Right. But the temptation of social media might be to divulge too much. Perhaps. Not not necessarily. Um, I just, I don't want people to feel like they could just reach out. <laughs> I get it. Yeah. And I'm not, by the way, I'm not advocating for it. I, yeah. uh, we've, we've read enough about it and the process. I guess um, it, it's not healthy really for us to be on it. And it's something we've, we're all negotiating on some level, but it's not really that great. I, I mean, I am on Facebook and I had to join Instagram cause I had to do an Instagram live chat with somebody and I didn't know what that was at all <laughs> so like I really did I really didn't know how to do that at all no it's fine posted but also sometimes I like I am on Facebook because my mom and dad and my brother are on Facebook right um and also I like people's birthdays and my own birthdays when <laughs> fa- you know on facebook it's so lovely when everyone says happy birthday to you it should be called birthday book it's really the only <laughs> it's the only reason i do it like i i do begrudgingly still uh not begrudgingly but i i do this show so i will post about that on my own wall but otherwise i don't really do anything anymore with it uh, and it used to be just a daily thing and now i spend most of my time on instagram for some reason, which is owned by Facebook. So it's, not, yeah. it is complicated, yeah. but so all this to say, you don't necessarily want people to follow you on Instagram, but if they wanted to, they could. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's, it's kind of, it, I look, but I look really cruel on Instagram because I have something like 570 followers, but I only follow like seven that's fine. You don't. Sorry. Again, this is not. <laughs> Do I a, have to follow people? No, no, like, will it's they, not. Will their, no. will their feelings be hurt? No. I really I mean, don't know. They, they will. Okay. I think there will be people who's, <laughs> oh, you know, I, I I, had a nice conversation with Sue at the party. And I followed her on Instagram and then she didn't follow me back. Sure. There will be people who feel that way. I, I guarantee it. I've felt that way. People, it's a weird, it's a weird maddening thing where you're like, oh, I thought, I thought I had a nice rapport with this person or whatever, or yeah, it's bad. It's very bad. It's all very bad. I'm not. I'm not suggesting it's you like should. I'm feelings, just feelings. Feelings that you don't really need to feel. No, and had, it's if if you had a great conversation with someone. Yeah, that know. should be enough. But it's yeah. Bad. But the whole system is like likes and notifications of likes, and it's really, it's really catering to your worst sort of conscious yeah. and subconscious instincts and impulses. Like it's not a good. So don't. All I was getting at with this and this, I didn't expect this. I normally wrap up these things by asking my guests to like promote themselves a little bit. So if you, if you want people to follow you on something or do you even have a website, Sue? I do have a website. Would you want people to know about that? Mm, I don't, I don't want it to crash. No, I'm just kidding. Um, Oh yeah, sure. It's a, should I send it to you or no? Just just say it. What, what is it? You can where people are listening. What is it? What is the what is the it, website? It's very long. It's um my first name and then a hyphen and then my last name dot com. That's fine. That's yeah. fine. You could. That's that's. And again, it's very old fashioned. So when you go on the website, it's not just a bunch of bugs you actually have to bring a mouse over (laughs) and then and then when the mouse touches that bug it'll tell you what section of the website you're on it's not really phone friendly is this what you meant by send you when you said send me the website you wanted to send me the instructions to how to use your website well no the address the address i know i know i I was making but also as i was talking about the address i realized oh but maybe some people may not know how to navigate it (laughs) so so where on the internet can we find the instruction manual to using your website (laughs) i think everyone here would like to know the the book is out on mcclellan and stewart and i think you can learn more about it uh at penguinrandomhouse.ca is that right yes okay and the book is a wondrous uh, award-winning. It's the winner of the 2020 Scotiabank Giller Prize. Uh, the book is called How to Pronounce Knife. Uh, Sue, I really can't thank you enough for this time and this conversation. It's been nice to reconnect with you. I hope you enjoyed this conversation 
and I wish you the best of luck with everything in the future. I did. Thank you so much for inviting me on your show. It's always a pleasure. Very, very special thanks again to Suvankam Tamavangsa for appearing on this, the 592nd episode of Creative Control, which is part of the Entertainment One Podcast Network and is available wherever you get your podcasts. If you can't find an episode you're looking for or if you want to learn more about me and sign up for my monthly newsletter, which is due out soon, actually. I'm sorry, I haven't got that out yet. But anyway, yeah, you can... What did I say? You can learn about me. You can sign up for my monthly newsletter. Oh, yeah. And you can, uh, what else? Is that it? Yeah, that's those are the things. Learn about me. Find an episode you can't find. Sign up for my monthly newsletter. You can do all of that on my website, vishkana.com. You can also like Creative Control on various social media platforms. You can also follow the show on Twitter, at Vish Creative, uh, or follow me directly on Twitter and on Instagram, at vishkana. I followed Sue. Uh, we'll see if she follows me based on her little thing there at the end but so far she hasn't i don't begrudge this anyway also please consider visiting patreon.com slash creative control to make a flexible monthly donation to keep this podcast going six dollars or more grants you access to exclusive content and if you're interested in receiving a creative control t-shirt please message me on patreon and i'll get you one while supplies last that's all for six dollars or more a month but you can also, like I say, it's it's flexible. Uh, you can change it at any point. If you started out at six and you want to go down to four, or if you want to go up to forty dollars a month, whatever it is that you want to do, you can do it. Again, Patreon.com/slash Creative Control. Thanks again to Live at MasseyHall.com, where you can watch beautifully captured concerts by great Canadian artists, and also to Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph, and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton for their in-kind support for this show. Uh, as always, thanks to uh, my dear old friend, Jim Guthrie, for letting me use uh, one of his songs. It's the instrumental version of The Rest Is Yet To Come that's playing behind me right now. But uh, Jim lets me use all sorts of music on the show, and you can learn more about uh, Jim and his work at jimguthrie.org. And finally, thank you for listening to this episode with Sue Vonkum and myself, and for subscribing to this podcast and, and, and suggesting to your friends that they do some of those things, if not all of them. Uh, you know, just spread the word about the show. All of that is very meaningful to me. So thank you very much. I will talk to you very soon. Goodbye for now.